Okay. Uh, so, looking at, at uh, a question we talked about this morning about whether we were going to have the discipline sort of segregated into stuff that people would be expected to use in a, in a normal course of events and things that would be relegated only for experts. And so I'm trying to see if we can get some of these moved beyond expert-only programming. This is just a repeat from my teaser earlier this morning. Um, that was interesting. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm not sure why it decided that it suddenly needed to uh, unmirror the display, so we'll try mirroring it again and, uh, and work. Oh, I see the problem. Let's try this. And then let's try keep the current configuration. And then we can get rid of this, and then maybe we'll actually have the same thing for a little while. Sorry about that. So uh, what, what was happening? And what, um, what I saw happening in this time was kind of a, a virtuous cycle. So we had acculturation, feeding on economics, feeding tooling, which helped more people understand how to make things work. And uh, of course, as you kept doing that, things went around. What do I mean by these? So acculturation is really what can be done and how things are done. In other words, we have a group of people. What are they going to do and how are they going to do it? If uh, as that changes, as they get, as a group, more ability, more comfort with uh, different techniques and use them, then, uh, then that increases their abilities. But if we can make that acculturation spread across a larger community, we end up with a change in economics. I said, this economics, it may sound a little strange. I'm always talking about money. No, I'm not. I'm talking about general economics. In this case, time is money. Also, hardware availability, which is how, mu which is how much scarcity is there. Right? So the less scarcity you have, the more people get involved. The more people are involved, the more tooling it makes sense to create. And by tooling, I'm using something fairly general, too. I mean investments in development that ease future development. And I'll give some examples later. And the more tooling you have, the more people can, can participate. And this just can keep going around and can make a large change in a fairly large distributed community, such as the kernel community, happen reasonably quickly. In this case, about three years. So we were in a situation uh, counter to the old thing where you have to let the old bastards like self retire before you make progress, um, where we actually had the same people in the community making a fairly large change in the way they did things and what they felt was possible and reasonable to do. So what the acculturation does is you spread the culture of being able to do something. You get more developers working with better productivity. And of course, uh, the more you have of that, you have better ROI for additional tooling. So if you only have 10 people working on a project, and you've got this tool that would take a year, somebody a year to make, and would result in a 1% improvement in each of these 10 people's productivity, why would you do it? You're going to burn a year, and you're going to a tenth of a year total out of the people per year. If you've got 1,000 people, and it's going to cost you a year to do it. You get 1% of those 1,000 people. You invest one year's worth of effort over a year, and you get 10 years per year after that. And so the size of the community makes a big difference over here on what tooling makes sense to create. All right. And the problem we've had in the parallel community for, especially in the 90s, we were so small, it made no sense to do any tooling whatsoever in many of the projects. And so we worked with very primitive, very primitive tools and uh, didn't get much acculturation result, and that meant not many people wanted to do it, and that persist, you know, persisted. Once 2003 hit and the processor frequencies leveled out, that switched around, and we were able to make this move much more quickly. So what kind of tooling? Well, this is specific at this point to the Linux current community. Um, the three tools I'm gonna, not going to talk about much right now, but they're listed in the, tape, in the paper. Sparse was a static analyzer. Lockdep was perhaps the most successful of the three. It was a, uh, a deadlock analyzer. They would find cycles in the locking graph and yell at you about them with fairly low overhead. Not enough to rerun it in production, but small enough overhead to where it was plenty reasonable to use in testing. And Cochinel was, uh, it could be considered sort of like the uh, like a said script, except it used, knows about C code. Um, the other thing that was really important, especially on open source projects, is that as we started generating code and having parallel algorithms out there, and then people could study that code, see what it did, how it worked, play with it, and gain an understanding of how to, how to propagate that out. 
Now, admittedly, uh, there was no shortage of uh, copy and paste programming that happens, and that can result in bugs, but the fact it was visible and anybody could look at it helped make this cycle go faster. Again, one of the problems we had in the 90s was there were very, very few, very little publicly available parallel code. If you wanted to see parallel code, you had to be associated with some corporation that was doing it, and it was private to, their, uh, to their, them and their customers. I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools. Um, Sparse was motivated, it was, it was applied to parallelism late in the game, but it was motivated by user kernel pointer errors. Inside a kernel, you may have a pointer that refers to something inside the kernel, or it may refer to something in the user address space. And we had a lot of bugs where those would get confused and cause all sorts of horrible problems. Um, and it was extended fairly rapidly to locking because it could fairly easily determine that you'd acquired the lock but never released it, or something similar. In some cases, it's not the last smart, uh, and that allowed its use in concurrency. Uh, lock depth was motivated by real-time work. The problem we found uh, starting about 2004, 2005 is where we got serious about making, getting real-time response into the Linux kernel, and that meant driving preemption further into the kernel. And if you have preemption, that's similar to having more CPUs. If you have, if you, if you have run the block with no preemption, um, a CPU just does its thing and it's there. If you have preemption, it can get preempted and your number of CPUs is in some sense similar to the number of tasks, number of threads, as opposed to the number of physical CPUs. The real-time developers quickly got really, 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 really tired of fixing everybody else's deadlocks, especially since they were being added to the code about as fast as we could fix them. And so um, Inga Molnar and uh, later on Peter Zelstra and uh, Steve Rostat worked on getting the lock ordering thing in. Yeah? No, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a compile time option. I suppose you could do binary rewriting with it or, so, or some kind of uh, library substitution uh, so to make no, it work. There's no guarantee that, 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 the, that the recompile program would be different. Um, so what, okay, so that's an excellent point. Uh, you might recompile the program and change the timing, but this is looking for potential deadlocks. In other words, this can produce false positives. So rather than find a deadlock, what it does is record the order of the locks and record that into a large graph, a directed graph. If it finds a cycle in the graph, which might not be a deadlock, you might not have deadlock yet, but you have found a place where locks are quite in order that might result in deadlock, then it will, it will complain. And so um, it's, a, it's a dynamic thing. It happens at runtime. And therefore, that means that uh, it, you could miss things. There, you have to actually run a test that would exercise the locks. On the other hand, you can get little pieces of the cycle a bit at a time, so it's able to find a potential deadlock, even though that deadlock never actually occurred. Does that, does that make sense, or, okay? Or it doesn't fix these facts, it reports them, and then the it reports them. them gets shamed into continuing. Well, or somebody fixes it anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, it is not an automatic fix. Um, and uh, again, in, the, in this experience, pointing the bugs out, especially pointing them out quickly after they'd written the code as opposed to years later, was very effective. They had the code still in their head and they could make the changes. Um, uh, having it automatically make the changes is more inside the second, the third one, Cochinelle, which is French for, for ladybug. So named because ladybugs eat other bugs. Um, and the idea here is that you can make scripts that will scan the source base so if you find an instance of a bug, they look at the bugzilla and say, oh, there's this bug because somebody used this, this parameter, this procedure in the wrong way. So they would make a pattern that would search the, and search the whole code base for similar cases where somebody misused that API. And if there was a simple fix, they could make it search that and, and, and also at the same time produce the series of patches required to make all the fixes for everything it found. Uh, this turned out to be quite effective. Um, it took a while before anybody in the community learned to use the tool, but uh, the academic group that did the project uh, ended up being the top 20 developers on a number of releases of the Linux kernel as they found these various patches and fixed them. So uh, you, could, you could say that they lived among us. All right, so what I'm arguing is that if we, if we look at it from a look at the soft skills, the cultural aspects, and the tooling and the economics, it should be possible to get things that are expert only into common use more quickly than I would have believed if I had not lived through the experience. 
all right? And that comes down to the question of how do you best motivate that? And each of these was, was motivated by something, usually not directly involved with concurrency aside from maybe locked up. But um, again, that uh, the uh, motivation was provided by the greater number of users. And so having, having projects that can share uh, various infrastructure pieces, tooling, source code control, things like that, would be something that would help greatly help move these things forward. One question is if we make all the experts only stuff such that anybody can use it, what the heck do we work on, us, uh, us people that consider ourselves to be experts? I don't think there's any shortage. I'm not going to read through this, but you know, and you know, this, this is just what I came up with in a quick period of time. There's a year idea here. I'm sure that you could make this be 15 or 20 slides if we sat down and brainstormed on it, which I'm not recommending, actually. So that's uh, what I had to say. Um, at that point, this point, I think we can start the discussion. Uh, any questions specifically for my presentation before we go forward there? Yeah, it looks like you've got four minutes left for your questions. So I'm still trying to understand that first diagram that you put up with the three boxes. Yep. Okay, so um, let's take the parallel programming in 1990 versus today. In 1990, uh, were you parallel programming in 1990, Mark? Uh, I was. Doug might have been. I don't know. Okay. Um, Mark was. Uh, so every, everybody was doing parallel programming in 1990. Raise your hand. Okay. How, uh, people are doing prog have done parallel programming this year. Raise your hand. Okay. You notice there's a difference in the number of people raise their hands. All right. And what that means is that. Uh, the benefit of doing some kind of tooling is much greater in 2012 than it was in 1990. Okay? Now, as we make the tooling to make things work better, more people will be able to take on these problems. You know, uh, and because the tooling makes it easier. Thus, we increase the number of people doing this, which great changes the economics again, makes it so that uh, tooling that has not quite as good an ROI, not quite as good a, a benefit, be suddenly becomes useful doing useful to do, and that further can increase that. Now, yes, it's possible to do a tool that makes things worse and to be really good about marketing it so that everybody uses it and makes things worse. That's true, but, you know, all else being equal, uh, you would hope that people would notice that at some point, which might be a triumph of hope over experience, but so it goes. Does that, does that make sense, or am I missing the point of your question? You're missing the point of your question. Okay. I, I was also struggling to understand exactly that question, and then I think I got it. I think you're not changing the economics, you're changing the input to the economics. Okay. In other that's words, if supply goes up, then mm -hmm. the price goes down. That didn't change economics. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm using it in the colloquial term where people say they changed the economics when they made right. some change in the inputs. Right. But so, uh, if you want to be pedantic, you could argue that your, well, your view is more correct. Even if you, don't, if, you, if you want to be correct, I'm sorry, I'm being obnoxious again. So <laughs> I'm good at it. Yes. That's right. And the top box, the way the population, I would call the population program. Well, the, uh, the acculturation is how you get the population of programmers to be there. So uh, acculturation is just the, what you can do to get people on board. So at Sequent, for example, in the 90s, we used a, an apprenticeship program, which was very, very effective. But it, it can't scale very well. You only have you, you have you basically take a new person surrounding with people who know what they're doing, you know, inspect the work, um, beat into them, no, do it this way. Well, I don't want to do it this way. I want no, do it this way. It works. Your way doesn't. Uh, whereas you have, if people are isolated, they will often they'll often do it the other way, and it might work well enough to get them by, and then that uh, bad so practice you, spreads. So you've now changed the process. Yes. By having books to read and tools to use. Mm -hmm. The books to read aren't as effective as they might be because people tend to want to just hack instead of reading them. But, but in, a, in a perfect world, I agree with you. <laughs> well, I, I have gotten uh, I have gotten good pull requests from uh, people using it in classes, so yeah, somebody's using it. Yes. But I would suspect that 
May, may, okay, so may, I, res may I respond to this and then we can... Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you respond, but consider that the first response of the general discussion. 